Hey, what's up everyone? It's Dr. Spencer here and I wanted to do a quick little video presentation for trainers on how to treat obesity beyond eat less, move more. I've done this uh, talk a few times at some conferences, both for physicians, uh, tailored a little bit differently of course, and for trainers and a lot of people really liked it so I figured I'd put it on the web and share it with y'all. Alright, let's get started. So quickly about me, I don't want to belabor any points about me, because you're here to learn about obesity, but I got a, a BA in exercise science from UNC Chapel Hill, and I also wrestled for them as their heavyweight for a few years, did pretty well. Uh, I got my DO degree, which is equivalent in the States to an MD. In the UK, uh, it's not the same thing, so just know that uh, it's basically a DO and an MD are equivalent in the States, and that's what I got at uh, Virginia Tech's uh, osteopathic medical school over in Blacksburg. And then I went to family medicine and then eventually specialized in obesity medicine. Right now I'm in Maryland. So uh, quickly there's some pictures uh, up there. I'm showing me wrestling at UNC. Did a quick little uh, experiment with bodybuilding and then I did a triathlon uh, stint there and actually outran my fork, gained weight, uh, lean weight, while actually not tracking calories or macros and just exercising a ton. So that was an interesting story. We can discuss that at another point. It's just a quick about me. So enough about me. How does obesity happen and why is this important for trainers? And I'll explain that in a little bit. But for all intents and purposes for this lecture, it's basically an energy imbalance. And if you've been around long enough on the internet and, and discussed this, you understand that basically we're somehow storing more energy uh, than burning. And, and for this lecture, it's, it's because we're taking in too much and, and not burning enough off. But it's still beyond eat less, move more, because while that still is true, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And, and the complexities of why those things are true are, are what matters. So let's get into that a bit. The obligatory maps of the CDC showing back in the 90s, you can see that it's around 10%, 10 to 15% uh, of obesity among adults. Every 10 years, it gets a little bit worse and worse. Here's 2014, you can see even some states with over a third uh, of the population of adults have obesity. So pretty prevalent. This is just in the States. I don't have the global data on here. All right. So how do we diagnose obesity? Now, I know this is what's controversial, especially among trainers, because we're, we're used to this only anthropometric measure of, of obesity, meaning we diagnose obesity with just a BMI of over 30. As the trainers know, this can get a little bit sticky because uh, trainers are muscular and uh, it doesn't work as well with them. So let's get into that and why this is um, uh, a little bit controversial here. So body mass index. Everybody's seen this before and this is where people start arguing on the internet of why obesity may not be a disease which is what I'll talk about in a second. But anyway, here, overweight, BMI of 25 to 29.9. Obesity is over 30, and then you can actually break down the classes of, of obesity, uh, class 1 being 30 to, to just under 35, class 2 being over 35, just under 40, and class 3, which most people refer to as morbid obesity, of over 40 kilograms per meter squared. Now, I know in the muscular populations, especially the trainers, this is, you, you can get actually people that are overweight or even in that class one, close to that class one obesity who uh, have abs. So that, those pictures of me, um, I'm, I'm considered overweight, but I, I have abs if you're, if you're using this. In the general population, this actually does work pretty well though. And let me show you why we use this. It's a quick screening. Obviously, you guys are probably getting a weight and a height. This is what's easy in the doctor's office, weight and a height. Everybody gets it. 
And here you can see that those who are underweight according to BMI are at a higher risk of dying. And those at a higher uh, BMI are also at risk of dying. Um, and that's why, you know, it's pretty easy to, to do for a screening test. It should only be used for a screening and not just not for a diagnosis, though. And we'll get into that uh, shortly a little bit here. Waist circumference. I hope everybody that's listening here gets a waist circumference on their clients. <clears throat> Doctors aren't doing this enough, and, and I think there will be a big push to do this a little bit more. But we think that, uh, well, not that we think. We know actually where we store that fat, not just globally, but where we store it around that waist is probably more important than that global uh, fat storage. So in, in Americans, um, we have these cutoffs right here of 40 uh, inches and 35 in women. But um, other populations actually have lower cutoffs, and I'll, I'll kind of explain why. But basically, it's in other ethnicities, there's a lower threshold for having obesity-related complications, which I'll show in a second. So make note there of, of the Asian populations. Much, much uh, smaller waist circumferences cause uh, issues, so um, be aware of that. And here's something showing, actually, controlling for BMI the larger your waist circumference, the more the higher risk of, of death you have. Pretty interesting stuff. Maybe where we store the fat matters, not just globally, again. All right. And here's body fat percentage, which everybody talks about. Why don't we do DEXA scans and all these different things? Well, you know, it's, it's just harder to do that in the clinic and, and for ease sake and, and money and time. We, it's easy to get a, a, a weight and a height. And then just plot them there on the BMI, and it, it works pretty well, but we can't, you know, obviously use that for every single individual, including someone like me and most trainers who lift. So anyway, the, there's not a lot of data about this um, body fat percentage because it just hasn't been studied as well. Like I said, it's not as easy to do. But you can see here um, that there was just a recent study showing those who are considered that derogatory term of skinny fat, those with who would consider lean with a BMI, but actually have a high uh, body fat percentage, those who are under muscled, they also have an increased mortality. So stuff that trainers already know. People, we need to be getting people more muscle, less fat, and, and this is obvious to trainers, but this is just some studies to show that is actually the case. Now this is where we get into obesity being more of a clinical diagnosis, not just anthropometric with body measurements. There's some, there, there are these staging tools. This one's uh, the Edmonton Obesity Staging System uh, developed by uh, Dr. Arya Sharma up in Canada. Very cool, but you can see here uh, stage zero, <clears throat> there are no obesity related risk factors or, or issues. So. Um, someone that just has excess weight with no back pain, knee pains, or blood sugar issues, things like that. As you go to stage one, all of a sudden you start getting those subclinical issues. So pre-diabetes, just mildly elevated blood sugars, maybe some knee pain, back pain, uh, maybe even some psychological issues, maybe some pre-hypertension, just slightly elevated blood, blood pressures. Then you go to stage two, and then now they have the established obesity-related issues. So uh, they start getting that osteoarthritis in their knees. They start getting the sleep apnea. They start getting the reflux. They start getting the diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, and, and hypertension. Then stage three and four are more severe um, and significant issues with that. So car hard cardiovascular disease and things like that. Now this is important because watch this. You can see up here in the left-hand corner, uh, those with class th 3 obesity, remember class 3 obesity was over a 40 um, BMI, <clears throat> you can see that when you stage them out, those with a stage 0, and you can see this in the class 2 and class 1 and overweight, those with a stage 0, no obesity-related diseases and issues, they actually do pretty well. You see that they are, uh, their mortality is is pretty much normal and then once you go up in the stages those with the more severe obesity related issues you can see that they 
are having the, the higher mortality. You can see that with the blue line there. Stage two, same thing. And so it starts teasing out things. It's not just about that, that anthropometric measure of BMI um, and, and maybe even waist circumference, but actually those weight-related issues. So let's talk about obesity as a disease. So this is, this is where we get into it a little bit more. So the AMA uh, labeled it as a disease in 2013. Here's what they used to define that criteria. Impaired normally bodily function, characteristic signs and symptoms associated with harm or morbidity, and an increased risk of mortality and complications. Okay, standard enough. We, we think that it may fit it based on those, but let's go into those. There's something called adiposopathy, or sick fat is what we call it. And it's that fat that surrounds our waist. So a lot of people think that fat is just a storage uh, depot for, for energy to use later. But uh, we're finding, or we found, that it's actually one of the most uh, hormonally active tissues in our body. In fact, it's probably our biggest endocrine organ we have. So um, this is what kind of relieve, uh, leads to those dysfunctions that we have. Here we go. There's a little cartoon I had made, but basically that weight uh, right around our belly and our livers and our, the visceral fat, the stuff that surrounds our organs, that's the stuff that actually causes our blood pressure to be high based on some of the hormones and, and the other things that it secretes. It causes our insulin resistance. There's uh, circulating fatty acids that uh, kind of go around getting... Um, uh, put into some of our tissues that cause our blood sugars to go up and our insulin not to work as well. It causes our, our blood cholesterol levels and, and things like that to start to change unfavorably. This is all physiologic. Here's a little uh, picture from Dr. Bayes' uh, paper on this adiposopathy. And as you can see, there's all these different things from that waste fat that... Uh, is causing this. This is all physiological, not just, um, not just look, not just from excess weight. It's where it's stored causing these issues. <clears throat> and then we have the fat mass disease. So first we had the physiologic uh, adiposopathy or the sick fat. Now we just now we have issues from the actual fat mass. So I hope everybody uh, listening screens their clients uh, with a, a neck circumference too and, and asks some of these questions. So sleep apnea, if they're um, men and ne neck size is bigger than 17 inches or 43 centimeters and women bigger than 16 inches or about 40, 40 and a half centimeters, they may be at risk for sleep apnea. So just having excess weight around the neck, if they snore, uh, gasping when they're trying to sleep, if they feel tired in the morning. Just from having a big neck, this can, this can happen. And of course, sleep apnea can lead to all sorts of issues like heart arrhythmias and, and things like that. Very bad. Not the physiologic portion of the fat, but just where, uh, uh, how much is there. Same thing, excess weight causing more uh, um, pain and, and pressure on our joints, causing degeneration. This isn't necessarily physiologic, although some of that inflammation in our body can contribute to this too. Other things, like I talked about reflux and stress incontinence. So when we go back to our things that label obesity as a disease, um, uh, we can see that, yep, impaired normal bodily function. So we can talk about the, the blood sugars, blood pressures, and then also even how we sleep and how we move characteristic signs and symptoms, same thing, associated with harm or morbidity, same thing. And then, of course, the mortality, you know, uh, increased risk of heart disease uh, and, and things like that once we um, start gaining that, especially that adiposopathy, the stuff around our waist. So one, one of the arguments against um, obesity being a disease is that it's, it's a lifestyle uh, related issue. So then I, I would ask, why would hypertension or high blood pressure be a disease then? That's mostly lifestyle related. Of course, um, some people develop it uh, who seem to have normal lifestyle or, or healthy lifestyles. And of course, there are genetic causes, which 
we'll get into with obesity, but um, that can also be related to hypertension as well. Same thing with type 2 diabetes, very lifestyle related. Um, these things are lifestyle related and they are considered diseases, so why wouldn't obesity be the same thing? All right, so let's start getting into developing some empathy for those with obesity. So we, we talked about it being a disease, but um, I think let's, let's try to hammer this point home a little bit more. So there's, a, there's another cartoon analogy I, I had made. <clears throat> we don't go up to people with depression and uh, tell them, you just need to cheer up. That's, that's uh, inconsiderate. And we understand that there may be some neurochemical imbalances. There's also some psychosocial issues, maybe situational stuff. You can't just tell somebody with depression to cheer up. If you know somebody with depression, you understand how hard it can be. It's a tough, it's a tough um, issue and disease. Um, we also don't go to our alcoholic friends and just tell them you need to drink less. It's obvious they need to drink uh, less. We know there's a strong component in the brain and also psychosocial things. They, yes, they need to drink less, but just telling them to drink less uh, it doesn't work. And it's also um, somewhat inconsiderate, although I'm sure many people have done this before. So then when it comes to those with obesity, we, we still say, you just need to eat less and move more. You got to have more willpower. You got to put yourself away from the table. You got to put your fork down. You got to shake your head. Uh, when someone tells, asks you if you want seconds. This is not how it works though. And I'm going to show that those with obesity share a lot of the same uh, overlaps in pathology in the brain and, and environment um, uh, for, as, as those last examples. So I want you guys as trainers to be well equipped to treat those with obesity. And, and I'll get into that in just a second. So this is a quick little, uh, another example of having some empathy for those with obesity. This is a, a story I made. So um, imagine uh, Steve and Joe, they're both in utero right now. Steve is, is in the womb right over here on the left in Steve's mom. Joe's uh, in the womb over in uh, Joe's mom in, uh, on the right. So Steve, Steve's mom, she was always active all life. During her pregnancy, she gained the appropriate amount of weight. She exercised. She ate lots of fruits and vegetables, lean proteins, drank water. Joe's mom, on the other hand, was sedentary. She was also uh, a big fan of fast food, what we consider uh, unhealthier, uh, unhealthy options, a food choice. So the interesting thing about this is that Based on their choices, our mother's choices, there's actually metabolic programming that will uh, either help or hinder uh, Steve and Joe's outcomes in life. Those little changes, I, I'm sure many of you have heard of, obviously genetics, that plays a role, but then there's epigenetics, how our environment changes um, some of the way our genetics are, are, are shown. So... Someone who is leaner uh, makes better choices during pregnancy um, will have a child that will be leaner and um, for life likely, or at least have a better chance at it. Joe's obviously going to have a harder time because some of those epigenetic changes which have lifelong impacts. Was that a choice for Steve and Joe? Interesting thought. Same thing, you got vaginal births, associated with being leaner, uh, C-section births associated with weight gain. Again, this some of it could be association due to um, increased weights during pregnancy and, and, a, and a bigger baby, but there are some biological plausibilities, uh, potentially microbiome related due to coming out of the vaginal canal, maybe stress changes uh, in the, through the brain as they come through the vaginal canal. It, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, it, there, this could be uh, causation. And was that Steve and Joe's choice? No. And it might not have been the mother's choices either. But this is how it worked. Same thing. Breastfeeding leaner. Bottle fed a little bit heavier. Was that Steve and Joe's choice? Now we start getting the fi family dynamics. Uh, Steve's family 
sat around the table, talked, enjoyed their food, ate slowly, ate a lot of plants and, and lean protein, drank water. While maybe Joe's mom had to work a second job to make ends meet, his dad sitting there with sleep apnea, not really paying attention to him. He's sitting in the front of the TV, mindlessly eating, learning those habits at a young age, drinking soda, eating pizza. Um, so you can see, was that necessarily their choice? Do they have free will? I don't know. This is a metaphorical uh, question. It's, it's not necessarily meant to be answered. I'm just showing ways this, uh, these things can uh, affect us with obesity. More stuff. Steve's dad worked with uh, Steve at a young age, developed these healthy exercise habits young. And Joe's mom uh, was maybe yelling at Joe for disrupting class. He, you know, maybe he, uh, nobody was around. They were working too much as, as parents and he didn't get the good, um, as good of parenting or something, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, we could make up any story we want. Maybe he was given antipsychotics off-label. He's shown there holding a little bottle of, of medicine, um, which can cause weight gain. Was that necessarily his choice? So I'll, I want to show you here. In the end, we see Steve, who everybody is admiring, thinking he worked so hard, which he did. He did. He, he's worked hard all of his life. But then we see Joe over here. And most people think he's just lazy and, and doesn't work hard, but nobody knows his life story. So this is something where we got um, we got to empathize with, with those with obesity, especially as trainers, you guys, there's a lot of people out there that basically, you know, almost, they just fat shame. They just think that those with obesity are lazy uh, sacks of crap, and this is not true. There are a lot of people with obesity who are very successful in other parts of their life, but this is why it's so complicated. Um, we need to develop better empathy and, and understand uh, how to treat it because as trainers, I tell you, and I'll get into this a little bit, you guys uh, have a lot of power to change lives and you, you guys are going to be very integral to this uh, obesity treatment. Here's some other barriers. Obviously, money, rich lady driving a convertible, poor lady taking the bus, going to their various uh, supermarkets. The rich lady can go to the Whole Foods, and the poor lady, all she can get to is the local uh, convenience mart. Rich lady, her biggest choice of the day is, is buying organic berries or regular berries. It's a tough choice, but uh, the, the poor lady is trying to decide between potato chips and juice. Um, Again, these are extreme examples, of course, but you know, we got to look at these barriers. So, I'm painting a big picture of doom and gloom. So, are we screwed? And the answer, of course, is no. I just wanted to uh, put this in here uh, quickly. There, there are studies that show we can do things to overcome our um, genetics and epigenetics and, and all these other things. And this is where you guys are going to come in uh, because uh, if if you guys, you guys have the right tools. If you guys have the right tools, and I'm going to give you guys the right tools here, um, you can change the outcomes, and it's very important. The reason I paint this picture of doom and gloom to you guys, not to my patients, by the way, is so you guys have a very good understanding of the complexities of obesity. It is important to understand these complexities to then be able to help your clients overcome them. It's not supposed to be doom and gloom. It's so you guys understand it. You don't have to paint the picture of doom and gloom to, to your clients either. You just understand these things so then you can help them. All right. No. We're not screwed. We need empathy, as I've been discussing. So <clears throat> here's just a quick little uh, thing about that. Uh, this, this girl, Ashley Shackelford, you know, she's, she's sick of everybody telling her she needs to lose weight, so she comes out and says, um, just leave me alone, basically. So then on the other end, you have uh, people like this guy, John Burke, um, who basically says those with obesity are lazy. And so that kind of attitude actually breeds uh, similar hate. You know, a lot of people um, talk about political candidates who 
have certain viewpoints and, and how they breed hate, well, um, this does the same thing when you're online especially. And your, your clients may be following you online. Uh, I know my patients follow me online. And so I have to be careful the way I word things. Um, but if you can see here, these are his followers uh, just making comments about that Ashley Shackleford post, by the way. And here's a goofy little thing. I, I, I chose a goofy picture of Patrick here. But I, I want people to be more like Patrick. This guy, um, very smart and, and progressive when it comes to uh, being a trainer and in terms of obesity. He's, um, he understands the complexities. And this is my goal is to, is to teach you guys uh, to be more like Patrick. Here's another thing of why um, why, it's, why it's harmful to be uh, a fat shamer. So I have patients that come in that basically don't even want to see the doctor or didn't even want to come in because their last doctor or someone else um, basically fat shamed them and, and made them feel like they're lazy. But they don't want to feel like that, so they'll just keep doing their thing and just avoid treatment. So uh, this is for you guys as trainers to understand, be empathetic um, and understand the complexities to help the patients and clients. All right, so we actually don't need to help the clients lose a ton of weight. They're going to come into you. I mean, they come into me, same thing, with, uh, you know, 300, whatever, 300, 400 pounds, if they're 300 pounds, a lot of times they want to get down to 150, like what they were in high school or college, and I have to rein it in a little bit, but that's it's okay. I don't tell them that's impossible. I basically say, all I want to do is about 10%. So for someone who's 300 pounds, that's it's about 30 pounds. So um, that's where you start seeing these improvements in blood sugar, blood pressure, and even uh, pain on the joints and all these different things and the sleep apnea starts to resolve. So for you guys as trainers, um, you know, the, you can let them have their goals, but kind of rein them back and say, all right, let's start with that, this five to 10% weight loss. That's, that, that would be a good uh, starting goal because that's where you're going to start seeing those health benefits. Even though the client's going to come in, they, they want aesthetic changes. You're going to give that to them and we're going to discuss that. Um, but, uh, Start with this as a goal. <clears throat> oh yeah, so here are two guys, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Friedhoff. Smart, smart individuals. Um, they came up with this term called best weight. A lot of people uh, discuss this whole ideal weight. It, it's, it's, it's BS. It's not a real thing. So um, the goal is to get them to their best weight where it's the lowest weight where they still feel happy and, and they're also healthy. That's the goal, and that's kind of that whole 10% weight. They're, they may, they're not going to be happy necessarily with that 10% weight if you say that's all you can lose in the beginning. Um, you're going to help them do better than that, uh, but this is your goal in the long run, actually, is, is this best weight, no ideal weights. All right, so here's the question. Can you guys treat obesity? Here I am talking about obesity being a disease, and I'm treating it, and people talk about how trainers can't treat diseases, because it's beyond the scope. Well, you know, you're, you're not going to be talking about, I'm going to treat your obesity, but, you know, it's all semantics. You guys can, quote, treat, unquote, uh, obesity. It just, it, it, it's just you can't talk about it in a medical sense. So here's me, a bunch of doctors uh, on the left. Um, these doctors don't even lift, though. And then here's super trainers, Mark Fisher, great guy. Uh, Mark Fisher Fitness, if you don't follow him, I, I, I would. Um, and here's the difference between doctors and trainers. So as a doctor, I get to see my patients, and I see them frequently. I see them uh, once a month, and it's about 15-minute appointments. So think about that as trainers. You can see people... Uh, two or even three times a week for 60 minutes at a time. And why that matters is because there is there are studies that show that more face-to-face -face time, more frequency of face-to-face of -face time increases adherence. And increased adherence to what I'm going to show you uh, improves outcomes. Does it matter that uh, I'm a physician and trainer as a trainer you don't have a, 
a medical degree? No, you, in this course or in this, in this presentation, at least I'm going to show you, um, uh, things that you don't need a medical degree to actually do these things. The only thing you really need a medical degree for is or for prescriptions or understanding more of the medical issues that come along with obesity. But I'll, I'll explain that this is why you should probably work with a physician. But actually, as trainers, you guys may have more uh, power, more uh, pull to actually increase the chances of success for um, those with obesity and, and losing weight and keeping it off. And the most important thing is, is compassion and empathy, as I keep trying to discuss here. Um, there are a lot of doctors that basically say the same thing as, as some of these fat shamers. You just got to believe it. You just, you just got to, you just got to put your fork down. That's the one I, I love most. And put, just put your fork down. Um, eat less, move more, you know, that, that whole mentality. And, and that's wrong. It doesn't work. It's technically true, but it, it does not work. All right. And the, the number of doctors that don't even lift is too damn high. It's true. Doctors don't lift. You guys do. You understand how powerful lifestyle is. And unfortunately, other doctors don't promote this enough because they don't even lift. I try, you know, I make a joke out of that. Uh, and, and, and it may seem like I'm being elitist, but there's research, a lot of research that shows that doctors who uh, do exercise and, and are passionate about it are more likely to push it onto their patients, which is good. But if they don't lift or don't exercise, um, they're not as likely. So this is why I like working with trainers because you guys understand how powerful it is. All right. So diet and exercise to treat obesity. Yep. So dieting is not fun. And this is why lifestyle, when you look at these trials, it fails. It fails all the time. Um, Yes, people do need to eat less and move more, but it's not fun. But this is where we get into how you guys can actually help your clients do it uh, while not feeling miserable. All right. So a patient says they uh, lost weight. So how did they do it? It doesn't matter what their diet was. Uh, and this is the thing. What diet is the best? The one that allows for a lower diet. Uh, energy intake, which is sustainable. Now, I, in a, I'm going to make a course here that actually dives a little bit deeper into the uh, literature a little bit and discusses the nuances of this, the diets and how to implement diets in those with obesity. But the bottom line is you got to get them to eat less, but somehow how to sustain that for long term. And that's the key. So it's not just you got to eat less. We got to figure out how to make them do this. And so, you know, there are different diets you can choose from. Yes, it shows right here, 1,200 to 500 calorie uh, diet. That, that's, that's very low. I understand that. And um, for many, especially if you're working with someone one-on-one, -on -one, you may want to customize it a little bit more, which is what I'll discuss in another um, uh, lecture. But um, these are things that you can do, and if someone is not exercising, which I don't know why they'd come to a trainer unless they're going to exercise, but if they're not exercising, these lower calorie uh, set points are, are, are actually probably what you want to do. Um, again, uh, higher protein here is probably the best, though. You know, I said lower calorie, but you want a little bit higher amount of protein, which, again, I could get into a little bit more in depth later. You can also do low carb, low fat. You don't even have to count the calories if you do those things. But again, those have to be uh, stuck to long term. Again, I'll be making a, a lectures on that as well and how to do that. You know, here's something interesting. A lot of people think these um, shakes and, and things are, are not sustainable, but actually, um, uh, they can be very powerful tools and. and uh, I'll probably make a lecture just on this and how to do that uh, um, correctly. But basically, if you replace a meal with, with these protein shakes, it can automatically lower their calories, lower their total energy intake. And if they do it for long term, keep them um, at a lower weight. Here's a study um, looking at, this was over a year in the look-ahead uh, trial, which is a look-ahead study 
big study, but basically those who drank the most of these meal replacements had the best success in a year. All right, so now as trainers, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of how to train right now. There will be lectures on that, but uh, big picture, exercise does matter, not necessarily for weight loss, but definitely for weight maintenance. Those who have the most physical activity keep their weight off longest. And that threshold, it's a little bit high, and this isn't something they need to, need to do in the beginning, but the goal will eventually be 300 minutes a week. We want our clients to be obsessed, or my patients, I want them to eventually be obsessed with exercising to where it feels like it's a, one of their daily pills they take per day. That's my goal. <clears throat> in the beginning, it's not going to be like that, but that's the eventual goal. And that's what's shown to have the most success. Again, there will be more lectures going much more into depth on how to do this correctly. And here's a cool little uh, graph showing actually just exercise. Um, it can have such variability in weight loss. So you can see over on the left side of the graph, there are some people that lost like 25 pounds or 12 kilograms. And then there's some people that gained, you know, like 20 pounds or, you know, close to 10 um, kilograms. Uh, it was pretty interesting showing the variability here. All right, so let's get into why this lifestyle fails. I, I just went in, yeah, I, I talked about it, it being tough and hard to do. And then I talked about those diet and exercise things that you can do to actually help with weight loss. But, but then why does it fail? Why is it so tough? Let's get into that. So here's some statistics. Less than 3% actually keep the weight loss off, the 100% weight loss off after four to five years, that sounds pretty dismal. And only 28% can keep that 10% weight loss, uh, initial 10% of weight loss they had after four years. That also seems a little bit dismal. So that's not very good. But I want to train you guys to be able to do this a little bit better. And that's what we're going to get into a little bit now. So here's some ph uh, physiology. Um, uh, so there are set points, and I'm going to talk about that. There's also hunger issues and reward uh, reward center issues. Adaptive thermogenesis, which um, a lot of people know as metabolic adaptation. And then there's this thing where people lose weight and they stop, uh, they stop moving around. So this non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which we can get much more in-depth into uh, later in another lecture. Um, but basically, people just stop moving, fidgeting, walking around. Um, and I made a little joke here. Uh, James Krieger, very smart guy, did a whole lecture on this. It's, 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 uh, it's very good. But that's just one component of it. Let's get into the set point. So the set point theory is, is basically we have this lipostat, just like a thermostat in, in our body, in our brain. So we, our bodies fight to keep us at this same body fat level, body weight. And so you can see here on the left side of the, uh, of the, of, of the uh, pictures here, you have a certain amount of body fat. It has a signal, goes to your brain, and it controls your intake and energy expenditure. So you're neutral. As we gain fat, the middle, the middle picture there, it sends a signal to our brain uh, and, and, and basically makes us um, move more, uh, you know, fidgeting, uh, whatever we have to do. And it's supposed to have us... Um, decrease our intake. So then that is supposed to bring us back to that uh, left side of the graph, that neutral um, uh, body fat. Then as you lose fat, though, it sends a signal to our brain, increases our intake through appetite and stuff I'm going to talk about, and then decreases our expenditure. Same thing, that, that non-exercise activity thermogenesis, that fidgeting and stuff like that. Uh, for some reason, our bodies, unbeknownst to us, make us um, not do those things. And so that puts us in that positive energy balance and brings us back up to where we were before. So it's our bodies working against us. Doom and gloom stuff, again, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Then there's a settling point, and this is more about the inputs and outputs of maybe our environment and our habits and things like that. So you can see there um, uh, increased an increased input in the middle uh, um, picture there, the reservoir goes up, and if you keep doing those inputs, and, and, and then the, the um, reservoir will stay that way. 
And then you can see down there, you decrease the inputs in, in, in C, uh, the, the bottom one, um, the reservoir goes down. So that's kind of like our body fat and things like that. This is more of an environmental thing. Doesn't, it's, doesn't, it's not based on the physiology. And so some people think this is more of the correct theory. Now, I'm going to show you, they're, they're both correct, so there's probably a mixture of these two theories, but I just wanted to show these things to kind of get you starting to think about how uh, complex obesity is and why um, it's not just our physiology, but it's not just our environment, it's probably both. <clears throat> and then there's the metabolic adaptation. This is kind of goes more with the, the set point theory and the physiology, but basically... Um, uh, what happens is as we lose weight and we get down to a, a, a certain weight level, our resting metabolic rate lowers more than what we predict with, with a calculation. So um, say you have a, one guy who's just 200 pounds and then you have another guy who's 300 pounds who then loses weight to get down to 200 pounds. And those two guys have the same lifestyle, same body composition and everything. The guy with the, that was a, always stuck at 200 pounds that, that just stayed there will have a higher resting metabolic rate than the guy who lost weight to get down to that uh, 200 pounds. And that's one of the ways our bodies works against us. We could have whole lectures on that topic in the future. It's very interesting stuff. And if you have been paying attention to the news, you probably just saw that the biggest loser study um, by Kevin Hall came out and, and there were some very huge metabolic adaptations uh, to the point where some me people may call it a metabolic damage, um, which that's, again, that's another topic um, uh, for the future, but strong metabolic adaptations, trying to get your body to gain weight to go back to where it was before. So the biggest thing, though, is appetite. And this is where, you know, starting to work with a doctor may help you, um, but there are also a lot of dietary things that, can, that you can do for your uh, clients with obesity um, that will help you. So here's, here's this is actually Steve and Joe, grown up. You can see Steve who's lean and had, uh, has good eating habits. He has normal hunger uh, functions in the brain. Joe over here, his hunger signals are all messed up. His wires are frayed. He, it's not working very well. So here's a cool slide. This is uh, Dr. Garvey. I asked him for permission to, to use this. This is a very cool um, picture of the homeostatic regulation of energy intake in the brain. You can see how the peripheral signals we get from all over our, our body here. So with the stomach, we, we produce this stuff called ghrelin. It's a, it's a hunger hormone. We also have this stuff called leptin. And um, this comes from our fat cells. And we got this other stuff, CCK, GLP-1, peptide YY. Those come from our gut and then even amylin and insulin from our pancreas. So if you go to the next in the middle, you can see the hypothalamic pathways there with our arcuate nucleus. And uh, in those, in the arcuate nucleus, we have the rexogenic pathway or, or the, the hunger pathway and then the anorexic pathway, the satiety pathway. I'm not gonna get too far into depth, but you can see the crossover of all these different things um, working, the peripheral signals going up there like the ghrelin going to the AGRP, the NPY, um, in, the, in the arcuate nucleus, causing hunger, but then you got leptin um, blocking some of that up there and then actually um, promoting uh, satiety down there at the POMC and, and, and CART pathways. So this is pretty complex stuff, but basically those with obesity may have some dysfunctions in there. You know, those epigenetic changes when we were younger, maybe some genetic changes, um, or genetic causes of increased appetite. Uh, there, and, and as we uh, develop that obesity, especially the adiposopathy stuff, that sick fat that I discussed earlier, um, there can be some you know, things like leptin resistance, some inflammation in that hypothalamus that, that make these dysfunctional. Very important to understand that it's not just put your fork down and, and step away from the table. It makes it very hard. All right, and then there's something called the reward pathway, which I didn't show there in the brain. Uh, but basically, think of this as, um, uh, you know, when you're done with a meal, a pretty good meal, 
and you know you feel full but you can still fit in pie i mean this is this is obvious stuff we all know we have an extra stomach for for pie but this is true this is called the reward pathway and those are the parts in the brain you know the dopamine stuff um, that uh, allows to to keep eating the, the stuff that tastes really good so uh, in those with obesity they may have some um, dysfunctions in their reward pathway so again Step away from the table, put your fork down, saying no to seconds, especially when there's extra pie around, is a lot tougher for some with obesity. So just understanding that um, will be very important when you try to work with, uh, get strategies to help those with obesity. And so here we go. We got Steve there. His hunger's normal, but then you got Joe. Look at his, his wires are just blown now. And you can see also in this picture, um, Steve was also following some of those dietary habits that uh, uh, promote satiety too. It's not just his physiology, it's also his habits too. And, and, and Joe's eating those hyper palatable foods, those foods that don't really cause much um, satiety and uh, have high calories. And also he's mindlessly eating wine. At least he's, he's uh, watching TV there, not even thinking about what he's eating. So important stuff. And here we go. <clears throat> Here's a study that kind of looked at these hunger hormones and, and the things where I was just talking about. And this is a graph. Every, every graph of long-term or at least a year's worth of, of weight loss, you can see that um, people initially lose that weight. And slowly, you know, around that six-month uh, time frame, people start regaining their weight, unfortunately. But we're going we're gonna to learn how to defeat that. Here you go, those hunger hormones, the ghrelin up there in the left. You can see how the baseline, it was uh, on the lower end and as they started to lose weight, it went up and still at the end of the trial, still stayed elevated, working against them. Peptide YY, that's a satiety hormone. You can see the baseline, it was high. And as they lost weight, it started to lower. You know, again, working against them. Amylin, CCK, same kind of thing. And you can see here, baseline hunger, you know, on the lower end. And then as they lost weight, their hunger went up. Desire to eat, same thing. So, you know, just, again, you just got to have some um, empathy for those with obesity. Losing weight is tough. Keeping it off is tougher, a lot tougher. Um, and we're going to work on things to actually help to keep people from regaining that weight. So here we go. How to overcome these. Proper coaching. Again, we could go, I, I, I'm going to have some more in-depth lectures on this, but um, lots of protein. You guys know this. Protein is king when it comes to uh, promoting satiety. Volumetrics, big time vegetables and fruit, legumes, you know, the fiber, eating slower, things you guys already know. Uh, here's a cool study for the, the Diogenes uh, study here showed that those with a higher protein, uh, lower glycemic index, which, you know, we could probably get into the glycemic index sometime too, but basically those who are higher protein and, and more um, uh, lower glycemic index foods, they seem to uh, uh, keep the weight off better than those who had the other uh, lower protein and, and um uh, higher glycemic index diets. All right, so the other thing is increased visits. I, I already talked about this. I, um, I like to see people monthly, but you guys are actually seeing people, if you're doing it in person, at least once a week, and then you're doing 60 minutes at a time, I get 15 minutes. So this is why you guys as trainers are very powerful um, and have, can have a lot of success treating obesity. So um, the other thing is online support groups uh, and helping people online. Uh, and here's the study, another study from the Look Ahead um, uh, study that basically showed those with the highest amounts of visits did the best. And here's a cool study showing, hey, maybe internet uh, is almost as good as face-to-face -face stuff. And I know a lot of people listening to this, if they're savvy with the internet, they are probably doing both in-person and online training. Very powerful stuff. 
And I want to briefly touch on some of these medicines too, because I think it's important to understand the role they play. Um, I'll do a full lecture on on medicines that actually cause weight gain, but uh, I want to emphasize that you guys should be getting a client intake of the medicines they are taking. And again, I'll make a whole lecture on on which medicines you need to be aware of, like every single medicine, um, and then maybe some possible possible alternatives to have them discuss with their physician with, because not all physicians are aware of this, and they may not be thinking about weight. They should be, but they're not, and that's okay, but you guys can be the next line of, of treatment, not to tell them to stop medicines or to change medicines, but to give resources for them to then take to their physicians. Again, I'll have a, a much more in-depth lecture about that. And then there's some medicines right now. In the UK, um, th these aren't the same, but uh, in the US, these are the ones approved for weight loss. And I just wanted to briefly touch on them um, because basically they work in the brain uh, just like those dietary habits, which eventually we'll, we'll talk about. Um, but they basically work in the brain to make people not miserable when they're trying to lose weight. So here's a medicine called Qsimia. Um, Again, this, this has something called fentramine and topiramate. They work in different uh, parts of the brain at that, that same slide I showed, at, at those, um, those homeostatic regulation of appetite. In the, in the hypothalamus, they, they fit at the different receptors there, causes weight loss. Same thing with this stuff called Belvique. I can go into much more in depth of these later, you know, something as a resource to then be able to give to your clients and... Um, and then eventually give to their doctors in case uh, they're having issues with appetite. Contrave, same thing. And this one's a cool one. It actually may have some of that reward pathway benefit as opposed to just that, um, that hypothalamus homeostatic uh, energy intake um, benefit. And Sixenda, that's the GLP-1 stuff I showed there. It comes from the gut. You can actually inject that. So safety, uh, I'll get into that later at, at another time. The other thing is surgery. Now think of these things as tools. So you got medicine um, that you can refer out for, but you know sometimes medicine and lifestyle it just doesn't work. And I want to emphasize that these surgeries are actually just a tool. They're absolutely just a tool. Not they're not a quick fix. And um, you know again this can be another lecture for another time. But um, I don't want trainers to think that these are the easy way out. People can eat through these things. If you don't change their lifestyle, if you don't help with their psychology and their and the behavioral management, they will they'll regain their weight. I see it all the time, and um, uh, you know it's 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 not a quick fix. So um, be be empathetic if if some someone needs this. And the other thing is you you guys may eventually get those who have had the surgeries who still need help, and that's what I see a lot of, because I, I work with a surgeon, and that's what I do. I basically help um, those uh, who don't want surgery or those who have had surgery who then didn't have as much success as, as they'd like or they're starting to regain their weight, and you guys as trainers could definitely do this too. Very powerful stuff. Um, <clears throat> I don't have time to go into the case studies right now, but later we can go into all sorts of case studies. Um, I'm going to have lectures all about that, about, you know, you're going to have these kind of archetype uh, of clients who, they fit a certain pattern. A lot of these clients you're going to have fit patterns, whether they have appetite issues, maybe they have lifestyle issues, maybe they have both, maybe they have certain situations, things like night shift, um, night shift stuff and and certain jobs that cause them to overeat. Maybe it's their family. Maybe it's, you know, other certain dynamics with their spouse. Um, maybe, it's the, maybe it's the medicines they're, they're using. So I'm going to have all sorts of case studies for you guys to use to basically be able to fit your clients with those. So um, if you <laughs> too long didn't listen... <clears throat> Basically, obesity by definition is a disease. Fine. Okay. I hope we can all agree on that. Um, how we diagnose it makes a difference. It's not just anthropometric, but it's also clinical. I hope you guys understand that now losing weight and keeping it off is extremely tough. And we talked about some of the physiology and stuff there. 
very important to treat obesity, you have to have empathy. And last and foremost, though, you guys as trainers can and very well be very well should be an integral part of obesity management. All right, so um, I'm developing a course. It is, it's it's going to be very cool for you guys. Um, I I I want to train you guys to basically be just as good, if not better, than I am at treating obesity. Without, of course, you know, putting people on medicines. I want to be able to. Um, I want to be able to have all doctors in the world be able to refer to someone like you guys and have and have an ultimate resource. So, um, developing this thing, the obesity course, it's, it'll be an obesity course for trainers to learn everything you need to know. So, I, I highly recommend you check it out when it's available. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you, and talk to you soon.